Okay, I'll just stop. <laughs> Hi there. I'm going to talk about exactly the same thing we just talked about two minutes ago. <laughs> so how convenient. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit about struct PTUX and um, how it's been used over the years. And uh, I found that uh, to give some background on how it's used in different subsystems, it was interesting to take a historical perspective. Uh, so first, some history. Uh, and also the second reason why I do this is because it's fun. I had a lot of fun making these slides, so hopefully it's also fun for everyone here. Um, let's go back in the beginning of times. In 1991, in the Big Bang, when uh, Linux 001 was released, uh, we had an exception handler and we were saving some registers so we can do stuff in the kernel and restore them. Nothing special, just like kernel 101. And a few months later, uh, Linux 0 0.95 introduced uh, Ptrace Cisco. And um, so I, I found it was interesting to read about Ptrace and how this thing came to be. Uh, you had an interface where you could read an offset from, an offset from the kernel stack of another process. And uh, if you wanted to read registers of another process, uh, you had to know at which offset of the stack each register was saved by the exception handler. So struct PTUX was introduced with uh, no users in the kernel. It was just a UAPI with just a structure, and you would just use the offsets. Um, by the way, over time, I'm building this map of all the tracings of systems in the bottom of the slides, and they will grow bigger and bigger and bigger and, and very big. So pay attention to the bottom of the slides. The content is not so interesting. Uh, fast forward 12 years. <laughs> That's a lot of time. Uh, K-probs were introduced, and uh, the idea was to just put an exception, an instruction that causes an exception, and then in the exception handler, you were already saving all these registers, and then your K-prob handler would just conveniently get a pointer to the uh, registers and stack. So you can modify them and then it will get restored in the different state. How convenient. Uh, a year later, okay, red probes were introduced. And originally the way they worked is through this very simple knob trampoline. And uh, basically you will jump to that return trampoline and uh, you will have a K-probe on that knob. But uh, one year later, Mazami, who was already there, <laughs> he's been around for a while. Uh, Mazami made this a lot faster. Uh, the project was called Kevin Prop Booster. And the idea was, why would you go for an exception if you can just save the register immediately from the trampoline? And as it turns out, it's much faster. I, I believe one of the reasons is because uh, your CPU can also speculate on these instructions without having to take exception. So everything gets crazy fast. It's very cool. And the second reason is also that from the return probe, you probably don't need most of these registers. So why even save them? Uh, so there's a comment there that says skips, yes, EIP, and a bunch of them. And that's the first user I found of sparse PTREX. So basically, we're still saving a PTREX in the stack, but some of these fields were just not populated. And that's a pattern we'll see more and more of later uh, during the slides. Uh, fast forward a few years, Ftrace was introduced. Uh, so Ftrace was exposing the same count entry through a trampoline and over the years it got a lot of features and uh, one of them was the ability to save all registers same idea save all the PTRX and uh, a bit more recently it also got the ability to only save a subset of them uh, um, only the arguments basically just the registers which you actually care about and um, so the way this was implemented was with this ftrace regs wrapper so it's defined in an architectural specific way but for example on x86 it contains a PTREX and uh, only some of the fields are populated, uh, but the, the wrapper makes sure you access them in a safe way. So you, you shouldn't access the PTREX structure inside. You should go through these helper functions and they will only let you access the PTREX inside if it's safe. Right? And you have a lot of uh, nice abstractions. And, uh, yeah. uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about trace points because I'll get back to this. Uh, trace points per se do not use PTREX, it's a very nice set of macros to call tracers. Uh, I'll get back to this in a moment. You probe, you read probe, same principle as scape probe. You go for an exception, you have your PT regs, you pass it to your handler, blah, blah. It's always the same thing, right? <laughs> uh, more recently, a red hook was introduced. Exactly the same idea as scape probe. You have this trampoline, it saves the registers, you get your PT regs on the stack, and uh, you can call your handler and then get restored. Uh, actually, Red Hook is so similar to Carrot Probe that right now on x86, Carrot Probe got dropped and Red Hook and Carrot Probe are sort of the same thing, or the trampoline is the same at least. 
as part of this, fprop was also introduced, and fprop abstracts Red Hook and ftrace. And um, the way fprop registers to ftrace is by, by asking for full PT regs. Uh, so right now it only it, oh, it works on some architectures, but I can say it doesn't work on ARM64 because on ARM64 we cannot save all regs. I'll get back to this. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about eBPF and how eBPF fits in the picture because I often hear some misunderstanding about it uh, because eBPF is sort of this runtime or sandbox where you can run verified code, but you have plenty of attachment modes. Uh, and depending on how you attach, you get different signatures. So um, you have many eBPF programs, uh, which is something I found I know, sometimes misunderstood. But uh, some of them like uh, eBPF K-Prob, eBPF, eBPF U-Prob, eBPF Carrot Prob, eBPF multi k prob and I believe also eBPF TP or raw TP or one of them. Uh, they take PT regs as argument. Uh, interestingly, F entry and F exit, uh, the ones that which I think are recommended to use, uh, do not give a PT rex. They give an array of U64, and they are actually just the arguments. Um, TraceFS, so you can access most of this uh, <laughs> subsystem through TraceFS. Uh, and uh, so they also have sort of like a file under kernel trace. Uh, they all sort of do sort of the same thing. Uh, and they also use uh, PTREX for the most part. Um, and then uh, perf, you can access most of these events as perf events. And uh, perf sort of abstracts all of these subsystems. And the way perf is called is through PTREX. But you have situations in which the subsystem doesn't have a PTREX. So I was so talking earlier about trace points. Trace points, if you remember, didn't have a PTREX. So they sort of have to invent it, make it up on the go. Uh, so you have architectural specific uh, macros like this one, which create a very sparse PT regs with handcrafted fake registers. Uh, yeah. So I hope this builds a good picture of all the tracers we have, and that's important for what comes next. The problems. Uh, of course, if I'm here, it's because I have problems. Otherwise, I will stay at home. Um, so the statue here is Mark Redland right here. And uh, he, uh, one of the things I quote him saying is, uh, we incompletely fill PT regs with bogus values and cannot acquire some state reliabilities. Basically, what it means is uh, on ARM64 in trampolines, there are registers which we cannot access, which we cannot save. Uh, so either we have to invent them, we just say, oh, P state is uh, use 0x64, whatever. Um, or we don't populate them. And then if you try to access them in the PT regs, you will just read a null field or some garbage field, depending on where it's saved, and uh, troubles, troubles. Uh, so yeah, ideally we wouldn't be in the, we would have PT regs with just valid states, valid registers. Um, so now that we have this map of all the <laughs> tracers and how PT regs get propagated from one to the next, um, what we can do is we can see when we get a PT regs from an exception entry, and on ARM64, for example, we know that uh, all the registers are populated and they're populated correctly. And uh, we know when we get a PT regs from a trampoline. And in this case, uh, some registers might have been skipped for convenience. Some registers might have been made up uh, because we can't uh, save them in the architecture. Uh, but yeah, your PT regs is sort of, uh, I, I say invalid, maybe sparse or made up is a better word. Um, yeah, and why is this why this is this an issue? Is because of course all these subsystems they call uh, PTREX helpers, uh, which abstract some high level um, um, functions like is this PTREX uh, user space set of registers or a kernel space of registers? So it, it's all abstracted from the architecture. You don't have to think about which register is accessed. Uh, but if you call one of these helper on a PT Rex that is sparsely populated and happens to lack the field that you need to access your feature on the architecture you're running on, uh, you might have problems. And uh, uh, an example of, of this, so it, it was uh, it didn't get it to the kernel, like um, it was a mailing list discussion. It's just an example of how it would have been very easy to miss that there could have been potential troubles. Uh, so, so Mazami was working actually on uh, getting fprop working on ARM64, and uh, so in so in ARM64, ftrace cannot save a full picture regs. So, ftrace has a ftrace regs uh, with a sparse set of registers, 
and uh, fprob currently exposes pgbx to its users. Uh, so the idea of the, the series on, on the list was that uh, fprob will create a ptrex and copy the fields of the ftrace regs into that ptrex and then forward it to its users. <laughs> and if you actually trace all these users, Way down the line, you find out that uh, so fprob calls the trace fprob module, which calls the perf module, which calls at some point user mod, the, one of these uh, ptrex helper function. And on ARM64, this was accessing the p state field, which is the very field we could not save. Um, so now you're accessing a non populated field, and uh, maybe you're lucky and you're accessing a bit which needs to be zero and happens to be zero and things look like they work but um, essentially my the point i'm trying to make is it's very easy to end up in situations where um, uh, things break in very subtle ways and uh, that's no good <laughs> um so on topic of uh, um what can we do about this um there were some discussions about uh, evolving the apis and um this is sort of the talk that Mazami had just before on uh, can we replace some of these subsystems uh, that, that expose PT regs with other interfaces that expose F-trace regs. And uh, uh, we have some, these are, not, these are not really UAPI, these are not user boundaries, they are not meant to be 100% stable, but we have APIs which would preferably stay backward compatible for the users. And uh, I'm mostly talking about eBPF here. Uh, so, for example, eBPF K probe or eBPF rather eBPF K red probe uh, is something that a bunch of users are using, and I suppose preferably they would like to not break. Uh, so, it would be good to keep even if K red probe gets deleted, it would be good to keep some sort of backward compatibility for eBPF K red probe. And in this case, if we implement eBPF K red probe on something that doesn't save PTRX, uh, we need a, a transition plan. And uh, that could involve converting the F-trace regs to a PT regs, uh, which is potentially expensive on stack copies, or that could involve some transparent BPF JIT um, um, offset um, I don't know, remapping. Uh, I don't know, it gets into interesting territories. But um, yeah, the, the problem remains the same. and. Um, I was told I should uh, come up with conclusions. I and um, <laughs> you don't really know what to say, but uh, pretentiously, I'm uh, going to come up with recommendations, even though um, I haven't done any of this work. And uh, it's uh, amazing that all of this exists. Uh, but my recommendations, from my perspective, are um, let's try to avoid using more PTU eggs in trampolines because uh, that's an issue, at least on ARM64. Uh, let's avoid spreading PTU eggs everywhere in the kernel as we can end up in situations like this where different subsystems call one another. It's, it's so convenient to have pt but you can end up with <laughs> these sort of problems. Uh, let's keep really good documentation on uh, what registers we need populated, what registers are populated or not. Uh, and let's just stay careful. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't actually introduced any of these problems in the kernel right now. So um, this talk is more to raise awareness of the potential issues we could have if we are not careful. Um, and um, yeah, I hope it was somewhat interesting. That's what I had. Yeah. Could you, yeah, I guess, could you explain a little more about the P state issue? <laughs> I can't, but someone can. <laughs> so, on, so it's worth noting on ARM64, P state is, it stands for processor state. And that's all of the random flags that exist throughout the CPU. It's not a single register, right? It, it, it doesn't exist. There is no register to access to get it. Um, so that contains things like the, the actual flags NZCV for arithmetic checks, and that, which is exposed through a register. And there are a bunch of other things that get individually exposed through registers. But a lot of them are not exposed in registers at all. When we take an exception, the hardware saves all of that into a register called the Save Program Status Register. And we can get it all of it in one go, but only when we've taken an exception. When we return from an exception, we put the, the old value back into that SPSR and it gets restored into PSTATE. But if we want to write to those bits otherwise, we don't have a mechanism. So the, the issue there is that we only have that value at an exception boundary, at a function call boundary or any other piece of code. We, we just simply cannot access those bits. 
Um, and so like one of the things that's in there is the, the mode, which tells you, are you user space kernel, whatever. There are other bits like the exception masks um, and there's new bits coming in future. Um, so even if we fake something up today and it's good enough, a release or two down the line, that there's more bits in there that we have to keep on adding either uh, reading a register if we're lucky enough for one to exist or making up a value and it just be, it's completely unmaintainable. If like I, I don't know like I'm thinking like if most people don't care about the P state then like the rest of the registers are still there right and many but not all um, so right, there are other registers that we capture exception boundaries that we don't capture elsewhere, like PMR when we're using pseudo NMI and a, a bunch of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a similar problem. It's just incredibly difficult to keep that up to date and manage it. And even if you say most people don't care, you don't know that someone down the line isn't going to try and use like regs interrupt enabled or user mode or whatever other things. So. Uh, let me give a little history also of the F-trace regs. Um, I gave the same spiel at the BPF talk just earlier today. The, uh, Basically, the way F-trace regs came out was um, what happened was, <clears throat> you know, we as you showed, the M count trace, M count requires saving. So if you're going to trace a function, there's nothing in the C specification that tells you what needs to be saved to do a M count F entry or anything. That that's a compiler implementation detail only. So we don't. So I had to actually look at GCC or code to figure out what to save and such when I did this. But anyway, uh, the idea is when you, you have to save stuff before you could call functions to do the tracing. And that's where sort of basically the, everything had to save the arguments. Now, uh, a while back ago, this is when Alexei came to me and said, hey, we're trying to do PPF tracing. And when we, the only way we get the arguments is with this ftrace regs, which do, was created for Masami's K probes, which emulated a trace point in x86. So or not trace point, a, um, a break point. So we had actually saved all the registers. I have include this, the save flags, which is actually an expensive operation to actually do this, get you like, save flags from the CPU, that slows it down. So when you enable uh, F-trace with regs, whatever, that's much slower than if you said, don't give me the regs. I mean, uh, and because PPF needed the regs, the only way to get to arguments was with the regs thing. They said, well, this is way too slow. We want the direct trampolines and that went down that way. So it made me thinking, but well, wait a minute, we have all the regs, like we have this information always. Live kernel patching needs that information and it's using F-trace regs, the slower thing. So I'm like, why don't I pass it down? So what I did was I just did a partially filled PT regs and put it there. Peter Zylstra and Thomas Gleichner came back and said no, because it could be buggy if it's not fully populated. So I created an F-trace regs and the idea is with F-trace regs was it only focuses on the registers and stuff needed for function, like for function entry, function exit. So that's all it gives you. And what's nice about it is I also made it so the only way to access stuff is through access, uh, you know, say uh, well, methods to access the data inside the F-trace regs. That way, if it doesn't exist, it could tell you, like, sorry, this doesn't exist if we wanted to. So in fact, it holds PT regs because it's also something, if you say, I want F-trace with regs, you say, give me the regs and if all the, registers are actually populated within the F-trace regs, it gives you the regs. Otherwise, it gives you null, which is funny because the uh, ARM64 implementation of that give me the regs from F-trace regs is just a define, you know, arc give me F-trace regs, null. So there is, because you can't give the PT regs, it just defaults to null always. So this is the one thing I've been trying to push with this whole idea is if, like, let's try to get rid of the PT regs things because it came from P-trace which is also, we wish we could get rid of P-trace um, for those debugger people. Uh, <laughs> they they um, come up with something better. But the idea is, let's try to get, you know, what do you need those registers for? I mean, if you're doing actual like a probe in the middle of a function where you need random registers, yes, you might need the full PT regs to find the registers to give you the information. But if you're just doing function entry exit, there's a very small sub that all the other things are basically meaningless. Seriously, the flags, everything else on a function entry is basically meaningless. There's no reason to even get that. On 64, the difference in, sorry, on M64, the difference in size between PT regs and F-trace regs is substantial as well. It's like 336 bytes for PT regs and about 110 for F-trace regs. So you're also, you're saving in multiple dimensions there. Yeah, any other questions? Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you.